Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you today. Happy for another opportunity to share another portion of God's Word by way of reminder for all of us. Uh, we've been looking uh, about once a month or so in this first hour at God's uh, plan of redemption and the unfolding of His plan from the beginning of creation uh, or even from eternity to the end of time. Um, and in this we've looked at uh, of course the development of God's plan of redemption in the Old Testament and the fall of man into sin and God's promise and all of the prophecies back there looking forward to the coming of Christ, the Savior, the role of the law of Moses and uh, how that fits into God's plan, its limited uh, time frame and then looked at Christ and his ministry and the things that he's accomplished for us, the things that are uh, provided to man, the things that are required of man uh, in order to be saved. And in this lesson we want to look uh, at the Christian's worship in this plan of salvation, what God has set up for us in order to uh, serve him properly and be able to please him in this final age of uh, Bible history that we live in. And the word worship or serve is found many times in our Bible. It's a basic part of our duty and responsibility to uh, show our love and affection and, and uh, the fact that we adore God. I appreciate Steve's song. It definitely had a lot of the thoughts that are found in just looking at the different words that are translated worship, latruo, uh, worship or serve, to render homage or sacred service. Another word, pro Scunio uh, is uh, kiss the hand towards, to prostrate, uh, to reverence, to worship. It shows this again, that kind of adoration and sense of awe that you have for God, that you would bow down before him and put your face on the ground in front of him. And uh, it expresses that idea of reverence for God. And Sibo uh, or Sabo, so, Saboma, Sabomai, it is a word for reverence, to be devout, to, be, to worship. So those words are used at different places and translated worship or serve uh, throughout the New Testament. So we don't have any prescribed uh, liturgy or uh, you know, ritualistic uh, formula for worship that was handed down by Christ or the apostles where you know, it tells us we come in you know, somebody stands up and says this, and then we chant that, and we do the... It, there's no uh, set formula like that that's been given to us, a ritual. So what we have to depend upon is uh, commands and examples that are given in the New Testament to see how is it that we are to worship God in spirit and truth and do it in the proper way. We look at uh, what did the... what things did the apostles command the church to do when we come together and we put together that pattern and we look at what are the examples where the apostles were wor worshiping with people and it was obviously approved and we know that that's right and so we want to look at that uh, worship this morning and how to do it properly we know in the scriptures from our Lord that there is such a thing as vain worship and it's something that we need to understand. The Lord revealed it to us. Worship that's just based on what's been handed down by men is not proper. It has to be something handed down by God if it's going to be acceptable to Him. And it's been that way since Cain and Abel worshipped. We can go through the whole Old Testament and see over and over again that God wants to be worshipped and honored and served the way He says to do it. Not the way we want to do it. The way He wants it done. And it was that way uh, in the time of Christ and the apostles, and it should be our attitude as well. We don't want to waste our time in uh, worshiping God and do things that are displeasing in His sight. We want to make sure what we do is right and that He's going to accept it. In Matthew 15 and verse 8, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. We know that they had all kinds of rules and regulations that the rabbis had come up with over the years and bound upon the people like different kind of ceremonial wa uh, washings that they uh, were supposed to do before they ate their bread or came back from the marketplace and how to wash different uh, uh, cups and dishes and all of this stuff. 
and none of it is in the Old Testament. It all came from their own minds, and they were binding these commandments for worship on the people. And Jesus and his disciples would not follow those things. He says that when you follow the traditions of men, things that originate from man in worship, that they're empty, they're void, they're without purpose. So we only want to follow those uh, traditions that are handed down from God. God through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets. That's the type of worship we know is right and won't be wrong and that'll be pleasing in the Lord's sight. So we reject all worship that originates from men. Just because it's been done for a long time and a lot of people do it doesn't mean it pleases God. It wasn't true of those traditions. It's not true of any today. The, one, the type of worship God wants is the worship that he has given to us. Paul talks about man-made worship that is worthless. In the book of Colossians, in Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, that's the pagan ways of worshiping, all of their rituals and stuff that they had. He said, you died to that when you became a Christian. You don't follow those kind of practices anymore. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with the using in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of, of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgences. So they had people that were coming in with their philosophy of religion based on things that were done in Judaism or in paganism, and they brought in these rules and regulations and were binding them on Christians to make them better Christians, I guess. Don't eat this, don't taste that, don't touch this other thing. But the rules didn't come from Christ. They came from men. And he says it is will worship or self-made religion. And that is no good against the flesh. God knows what is best. Thayer says, a worship which one devises and prescribes for himself. That's not the kind of worship that God wants. Vine says, voluntary adopted worship, whether bidden or forbidden, which one affects for himself. Self-imposed system of ordinances, fallible human wisdom. It's of no profit against the flesh. You might say, well, I'm... I'm going to really build myself up to control the flesh. I'm not going to eat this or that or whatever. Uh, that, since that doesn't help you to d defeat the flesh. It's your attitude of mind that you're going to put off the things of the flesh. It's your determination to avoid those things. It is having good examples around you. That helps resist the flesh. Putting on the opposite of the fleshly desire. And put your mind and fill your life up with the right attitudes of love and care and concern for God and others that helps you resist the flesh. And practicing these good things, filling up your, your time doing what God wants you to do that helps you resist the flesh. But these rules that men come up with, that doesn't work. Now that's, we got the Holy Spirit on that. That's not my opinion. That's what the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, says. So... Man-made worship does not work. There's such a thing as ignorant worship that Paul talks about, and we don't want to have that either. God doesn't want ignorant worship. He wants people to worship that they know what they're doing and why they're doing it. In Acts 17, 22 and 23, and Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. He's there on Mars Hill, as it's translated in the King James Version, uh, before that high court there in the city of Athens and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. We need to know the truth about the nature and character of the God that we worship and what he wants and not the way we want to do it. It's gotta be a worship that's informed to be pleasing to God about God's nature and what we're doing and the kind of things that he approves of. So he is powerful and glorious and benevolent 
And that's the God that we worship, that's all-powerful, that made all things, both in the heavens and on the earth and in the sea that Paul tells them about. And that sent his son Jesus Christ into the world and gave him to be our judge and gave us proof by raising him from the dead. We have to have the proper knowledge of God that comes through his revelation to offer proper worship. The true object of worship is uh, the Lord our God. We're told in Matthew 4.10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So it is the one God that we serve, who is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has three uh, persons, but one nature, and they have a perfect unity together. Uh, you say, well, I don't understand that. I don't either. <laughs> I just believe what the evidence is that the scriptures provide, that that's the nature of this one God. He is a unity. And uh, Jesus Christ also accepted worship, so he is connected to that. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him, told about that blind man that Jesus healed. And Jesus received that worship. In John 20 and verse 28, when Thomas uh, saw the resurrected Christ, and was told to put his finger in the nail prints, he said, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. He recognizes Jesus as part of that one divinity that is there. He shares that divine nature. And he is an object of worship as well. That's true. Worship in spirit and truth, Jesus tells us, is what God desires. And we're not here to waste our time, are we? <laughs> we want to give God what he wants. And he wants worship in spirit and truth. That's the kind of worship. He's talking to the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. They worshiped at Mount Gerizim. And they had a false worship. Many of the things they taught weren't right. And uh, others worshiped, of course, the Jews at in the city of Jerusalem, but Jesus said there's an hour coming when it won't matter where you worship, it's going to matter how you worship. They're not going to be some holy site we've got to make a pilgrimage to in order to get close to God. It's anywhere where we worship in spirit and truth. God's going to be pleased. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know, and we worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we live in an age, the New Testament age, the gospel age, and we worship in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter where, it's how we offer worship to God. And worship uh, location is not important. There's no holy city, there's no site, there's no special building where worship is acceptable, and that's the only place you can go. Unlike the Old Testament, the Samaritans and in Catholicism, they have these holy chapels and holy places that you go to. Uh, in the Muslim religion, the same thing. They make their pilgrimages from here to there to these holy sites to draw near to God. That's not the way of Christ, not the way of the New Testament. Uh, those things are not important. It's a difficult principle, obviously, for people to accept because... How many millions of people look at it as you've got to have a holy site somewhere? No, it's how you worship. That's what God's looking for. Whether it's out, we're all gathered outside under a tree somewhere or wherever it might be. If we, God wants worship in spirit and truth, that's what he's looking for. Uh, physical postures emphasized a lot by people, but it's only significant in that it reflects what's truly in your heart. Your heart's got to be in it, right? It's got to be by spirit. Sometimes you have people kneeling and falling down uh, and worshiping, bowing the knee, falling on their face. Whatever posture, sitting or standing, it's the attitude of heart that God is looking for. And sometimes it's reflected in different kinds of posture. But what is important is the spirit that's in the worship. The acts of worship, God provides a means to offer devotion. 
It's been revealed by the Holy Spirit what pleases him in the commands and examples that we have in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they had the temple, they had a synagogue worship in which they had certain acts of worship at that time. Uh, they worship the horse that takes place privately in our own homes. We, we uh, adore God and show our reverence and love for him and a sense of awe for him. They have pu a horse of public worship where the congregation comes together in one place and offers up worship. The local church worship is very similar to what we would have found in a synagogue in the first century. There were some of the same basic things. They didn't have the Lord's Supper, of course. <laughs> that wasn't there. But as far as prayer and, and singing and giving and hearing sermons, that they had that in the synagogue. But, so we had those simple forms of worship repeated in the New Testament. And then you have the Lord's Supper as a reason on the first day of the week that we gather together to break bread and to remember our Lord and what his death means to us all and share in that together. That's one of the things, of course, is Christ is our one source of life that unifies us all as a body. So prayer is to be offered in worship. Special emphasis on this is an act of faith. And it certainly is a pure act of faith, isn't it? <laughs> you are addressing somebody that you believe in because of God's testimony. That you really believe he's there. You talk to him. You tell him about your needs. You give thanks to him. It's an act of faith that we pray. And God wants us to practice it on a regular basis. We have the examples throughout the life of Christ. Before many of the uh, uh, things that he performed in his ministry, he would get up early in the morning. Sometimes stay out all night praying and having this communion with God and addressing God. Uh, before he has selected the apostles, before his transfiguration, his suffering and agony in the garden to prepare for the cross. All of these things were connected with prayer. In the letters of the apostles, they abound in exhortations from Paul and others to pray for me. Right? Pray for these people. Pray for those people. And that's obviously something very important, this act of prayer. It's almost an inexhaustible subject. There have been many a sermon series that have been preached on prayer in the last 2,000 years, going into all of the different parts about prayer and the kinds of prayer and so on. Uh, acceptable service to God is prayer. And certainly it's an important part on the Lord's Day when we come together that we have prayer. In Hebrews 13, 15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's another way to describe worship. It's praising God. It's giving thanks to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And he wants to hear those prayers. He wants to hear those songs that are sung in praise to him. Singing is those uh, prayer and teaching and so on. Praise, of course, that is put to... Uh, uh, a melody of some kind and is offered up as a song and it is a way that pleases God that's done in heaven by the angels it was done in the New Testament church they never had it accompanied in the early church with instruments of music it all came from your heart that's what God wanted if that's what he wanted from Christ and the apostles when they set up the church don't you think that's what we ought to do if we want to please him we just do the same thing they did there was no instrumental music in, the, in uh, Christian worship until 700 and something A.D. And it split the church when they brought it in. So it's not something that's found in the New Testament. Uh, they had it in the Old Testament. It was a part of that physical, ritualistic, outward type of worship that they had. But it's not found in the New Testament. Jesus and the disciples were told after they finished the... Um, Passover and he instituted the Lord's Supper and he preached to them and after singing a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives Paul and Silas when they were locked up in prison in Philippi after being beaten there uh, says but about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them not only did they sing in the, you know when there were just two or three of them together but when they had the congregation came together they had singing. Paul's practice in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, what is the outcome then? I shall pray in, with the spirit and I shall pray with the mind also. 
I shall sing with the spirit and I shall sing with the mind also. So Paul uh, sang the songs and he always had his heart in what he was doing. He had an understanding of what he was singing and why he was singing it. He had to worship in spirit and according to the truth of God's word. Those two things are what God's looking for. And he always had his heart in it and he always did it according to what the scriptures teach is true. And that's what we should do as well, if that's what the New Testament church was doing. He instructs the Ephesians that you should have your minds filled up with the Word of God and your heart full of God's Word when you sing, so that you sing in the proper way. So it's, it's a, it, it matters what the words are that we're singing and what the attitude is we're singing with. In Ephesians 5 and verses 17 through 19, So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be, get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So we have uh, that passage tells us a lot about the singing in the church, doesn't it? How to do it properly. That we are filled with what the Holy Spirit has revealed in His Word. And that we offer up uh, these psalms like in the Old Testament that are teaching spiritual lessons and praising God. We sing hymns that praise the Lord. And that we sing spiritual songs that have a spiritual message and that have spiritual teaching in them. That that's the kind of songs and we make the melody not on an instrument, but we make it in our hearts. We pluck our hearts, heart strings when we sing and offer up these songs. A parallel verse that says the same thing and kind of is a commentary on the first or they were commentaries on each other when you put them together. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit's teaching is the word of God with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. What is the melody we're making in our heart? <laughs> all of the thanks we're offering up for all of the good things God has provided for us that we don't deserve. And we're giving our gratitude and praise to God when we come together to worship and sing. So singing is a very important item in our worship. You sing psalms, those Old Testament psalms and Christian psalms, uh, sacred songs used in music, hymns are religious songs of praise to God, spiritual songs are songs affecting the soul that teach and admonish, and the melody in your heart, that thanksgiving in your heart was to be accompanying the song that we sing. They had congregational singing. I will sing among the congregation, it mentions in the book of Romans 15.9, Gentiles were going to sing. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, so we don't have any special singing group that gets up here to perform for us. Any special solos that are offered, we don't see that in the New Testament. But we have congregational singing is what they were doing. We want to please God. We want to do it His way. We do that. We don't do it to entertain e each other or to show off some special musical talent that we have but we all sing together and teach and admonish each other in these songs. And let's follow that pattern. Let's leave off all ostentatious choirs and mechanical instruments and doing this just to entertain. Let's do it to praise God and to educate and edify each other. The Lord's Supper, of course, is a special part of the worship that's revealed by Christ and the apostles in the New Testament for Christians to practice. Jesus instituted it. It's very simple. It's something that can be uh, <clears throat> practiced all over the world. It's a universal religion that we have. And we have some grape juice and some unleavened bread. And you've got the elements you need all over the world to take the Lord's Supper and to be able to carry out what the Lord instituted. He took these elements out of the Passover meal. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread was where the Passover was at. So we know it was unleavened bread that they had. And they had uh, grape juice there as well. So it was a communion or a sharing in the body and the blood of Christ. So what is its purpose? We're all sharing 
in this salvation that the body and blood of Jesus provided for us. We're all showing our mutual appreciation for our source of spiritual nourishment and life. And uh, we have to remember where it all began and where it all came from and be reoriented every week. The Lord thought it was necessary. Every week, let's do this and remember what it's all about, what makes it all possible. And uh, we're sh mutual sharers or communers in that. So be partaken of on the Lord first day of the week. When should we do it? Well, we should do it when the apostles did it, right? Because they knew what pleased God. Acts 20 and 7, and on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. So they had a day of assembly, the first day of the week, the day that Christ was raised from the dead, the day the Holy Spirit came upon the church and revelation about the gospel was revealed. On that day, the church had its beginning. And we should be in our proper spirit on the Lord's Day and worship like John did on the Isle of Patmos. Let's worship God on the first day of the week in these ways and make sure we have the Lord's Supper every week. You're to eat and to drink in memory of Christ. You proclaim to all in the assembly, believer or unbeliever, that Jesus died for us, right? It gets preached every week. Whether we have it in the sermon or not, we've got it in the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26 and 27, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. To drink it in an unworthy manner is to not show that reverence and respect to the body and blood of Christ when you take the Lord's Supper. It's to not think properly about what that body was. Sinless, perfect body that uh, was, uh, took all of our sins, the punishment of our sins upon that body. We remember that body and honor it. And that blood, that life that was poured out for us in that blood. Violently so that we might live. In 1 Corinthians 11:28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So you can see there are many spiritual elements to the Lord's Supper, just as there is with prayer and singing. There's also with the Lord's Supper, it looks of many different directions. There's many thoughts that ought to be in your mind when you take the Lord's Supper, deep thoughts, to make it acceptable before God. It's worship in spirit and truth. We do it the right way and with the right attitude and right thoughts. Giving was something that was practiced on the first day of the week when the church came together. They gave in order to take care of needy saints, to take care of providing edification for the church and for spreading the gospel. Those are the works of the church and they have to be financed. And it's done through free will offerings that are given on the first day of the week. It's an exercise of stewardship. On the first day of every week, let each one put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collection be made when I come. There is fellowship in this preaching. It's a proof of our love, we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that we give into the treasury to help the poor saints or to help whatever work uh, the Lord has assigned to us. It's a duty of stewardship and worship. It's a responsibility we each have to do our part. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, Paul said, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's not a set amount. There's not a, a command to tithe in the New Testament. That's part of the Old Testament law. But we are to give liberally. Certainly that tithing back there kind of gives you an idea about what godly people have always given. But it's not bound upon us. It's worship from your heart because you want to that pleases God. And we need to give to God liberally. And not to use that, that uh, lack of the tithing command being bound on us to cause us to give less. But to give from our hearts liberally and God will give to us. 
Do it as you've purposed in your heart. Your spirit's got to be in it. Grudging, giving, God doesn't, is not pleased with. A cheerful giver, God loves. He's looking at the attitude as well as the action. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, we're told about preaching. We have many examples as well that could be read of when the church came together to take the Lord's Supper and to do these things, that they had preaching of God's Word. That it was a time for teaching. The church is about teaching, isn't it? About, uh, it's all about the gospel and the spread of the gospel and the practice of the gospel. Until I come, give attention to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. That's what Timothy as a preacher was to do, an evangelist in the first century. Uh, he was to give constant attention to this public worship and public reading of the Bible to people and to exhort them to do the things that it says and to give them instruction about what these words mean and what the context is, what the history was. There had to be teaching as well. So instruction, encouragements, exhortations to action. God's way of speaking to our heart is through preaching and teaching. We take that word and then we try to implant it. I mean, we also have the prayers and singing that does that too. The Lord's Supper does it, but this direct preaching is also a powerful way that God's word is communicated and we're able to hear God's will and listen to him. And of course, each of us should be thinking about the sermon as we're here to get our souls fed with God's word, the meat and milk of the word that builds up our souls. So we should pay attention uh, and we should strive to make application of that word. Understand it. Active. Be active in listening to a sermon. We're called upon God to help us with our salvation is what worship is about. And if this was the second sermon, I'd offer the invitation right there. <laughs> but since it's not, we'll stop right there. And we'll offer the invitation later. If you're... Uh, here this morning, let's all take it to heart to worship God in a way that pleases him. Let's, let's try to teach others to do the same. If you'll bow with me, we'll be dismissed to our classes.